Hi, I'm Sally Kim. I am very lucky to call myself Kylie Reed's editor and to introduce her astonishing debut novel, Such a Fun Age. So it's the story of a young black babysitter named Amira who works for an upper middle class family in Philadelphia and her employer, Alex, who runs a lifestyle brand for women. Uh, and in the first scene, Alex calls Amira and asks her to take their young toddler out of the house so they can deal with a family emergency. So Amira takes young Briar to a late night market to pass the time, and it's there where she's confronted by a security guard who accuses her of kidnapping the child. So it's the most explosive opening I think I've ever read, and the story is really off like a shot after that, but it develops into so much more than just that scene. When I describe this book, I say it's one of the best explorations of race and class and privilege in our time, but it also has a beating heart of a plot, and that's the fun of this book, is that it's smart and witty and funny and sometimes just plain wicked. And I can't tell you the, the number of people who've read this book and have come up to me and said, oh my god, that Thanksgiving scene. And that's what this book inspires. Um, there's so many moments where you think to yourself, how can a book that explores such important and timely topics be so much fun to read? So that was Kylie Reed's intention. Um, Kylie, who just, by the way, three weeks ago graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, I remember in our first call, she whispered to me, I kind of stick out here at Iowa because I like plot. And <laughs> that was the moment I knew I had to work with her. Um, and I realize now that she's the only person who could have written this, this mix of a book because she's the smartest and funniest person I know and that charisma really leaps off the page. So many people have read this book and have admitted to me that they've gone down the rabbit hole of her social media because she is so honest and so relatable, it's like you know her. So this is a book that balances big-hearted empathy with social, piercing social commentary. And it begs conversation, and it adds to the conversation. And I thank my lucky stars every day that Kylie has written this book for us. So here she is to tell you more. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am also the baby, and this is also the first time I'm talking about this book, and I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, so I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. Anyone? Arizona? No? Nope? Okay, cool. Me neither. It's fine. Um, <laughs> My family moved to Arizona from Los Angeles when I was seven, and for people used to an ocean breeze, Tucson made it very hard to find a release. The day we moved there, I remember it was 117 degrees. Um, for me, the heat wasn't the only thing that I was trying to escape. Uh, my adolescence was spent trying to escape my helicopter parents who refused to leave me alone. I grew up with the type of parents who never let me be by myself. I wasn't allowed to go to the mall, um, be at home by myself, go on dates, as well as a lot of other very cool things like pierce my ears, <laughs> wear black nail polish, shave my legs, have opinions of my own, like those kind of things. Uh, one thing I was allowed to do was read. And like many writers, I found libraries as this haven for possibilities and stories. I particularly loved the baby name books there, which I find is a telltale sign of a writer. You're carrying around a baby book for when you get bored. Um, and they were always my favorite. But if I'm honest, growing up, it wasn't the words and stories that drew me to libraries first. It was the fantastic and aggressive air conditioning. <laughs> yes. Shout out to the Nini Library for keeping it cool, 69 degrees. And it was also the walls and walls of books, of pages, and separation that let me find my own thoughts. The library was a place where my parents could come with me, but I could still feel like I was by myself. And being alone became a huge theme in my writing. Um, pretty much everything I wrote from age eight to 13 had the same like being alone motif. So this was the plot of everything I wrote. A handful of teenagers get stuck in a place, there are no parents, and then they just make out with each other. Like, <laughs> that was everything. Sometimes it was a mall, um, one time it was an island, I stand by that one, it was good. Um, one time it was a library as well, 
But more than anything, I just craved the tensions of teenagers being able to be themselves in the same way that libraries let me be myself at a really pivotal time. And I'm going to talk about my novel, and that is not the plot of my novel, I promise. Okay. <laughs> I've moved very far away from that. So I lived in New York City for most of my 20s, and in 2016, I started to hit a wall with my writing. Um, the same year, I applied to nine graduate schools, and I got rejected by every single one of them. So after a round of rejections, my then boyfriend said, hey, I have this job opportunity in Arkansas. Come with me. You can write your butt off and apply to grad school again. I said yes. Anyone from Fayetteville, Arkansas? Arkansas, anyone? Nope, cool, all right. Um, <laughs> Arkansas is rad, I loved it. And the Fayetteville Public Library was the first stop for me. After living in New York City for nine years, this library, this small town, it seemed like one great big way to just be alone. The Fayetteville Public Library has this really beautiful reading room with wood floors and really high ceilings, and the ceiling comes together on what looks like a book spine above your head and it's gorgeous and that was where I spent most of my time. Underneath that book spine was where I applied to 16 grad schools where I wrote blog entries for a coffee shop and where I wrote what would become my first novel in between. I'm happy to say that I did not receive all rejections. I received nine acceptances that second time and I recently graduated as Sally said and my then boyfriend as of two months ago is now my husband so it all <laughs> worked out. <laughs> Um, libraries have a way of drawing us in so that you can't help but see that people don't belong to their problems and how it's always the other way around. I find it really lovely that librarians are so ready to talk to whoever comes to that front desk and I love watching them because you can tell they're truly listening and trying to figure out what that person needs, how they need it, and it goes way far beyond a book title or directions to the bathroom. We, myself included, are so used to dealing with the same kinds of people who speak the same way, who have the same problems, and when we get too comfortable, we start seeing problems as a manifestation of that person and not the other way around. So I tip my hat to you librarians for being observers of people and not just because it's the job. And by being excellent observers, you can't help but become excellent readers. So that's why I'm really excited to tell you about my novel. Such a Fun Age is my first novel, and it works as a comedy of good intentions. There are no good or, good or bad people in this novel. It's just humans trying to do the right thing, whether it's for the good reason or a bad reason. My agent originally pitched, pitched it as a Curtis Sittenfeld novel told through the voice of HBO's Insecure, and most of the words readers use to describe it are cringy, uncomfortable, and fun. <laughs> Um, as Sally said, it starts with Amira, a young black babysitter who's at that post-graduate period of her life, the kind of, the kind of page where you eat the same crock-pot meals two night, every night a week because that's all you know how to make, and how she is accused of kidnapping a child that she is babysitting. Uh, this story, this book is also about how we overestimate and how we underestimate people as well. And while it's a complete work of fiction, I am going to tell you a true story from when I was babysitting. Um, I was babysitting for a woman here in New York randomly, and she really wanted me to be her permanent Saturday night babysitter. And I couldn't because I had another job, and I said, you know, I have a friend named Mary. She can do it for you. And she said, oh, I really want you. Tell me about Mary. I said, she's super responsible. She's super cute. You're going to love her. And this woman said to me, oh, God, she's not too cute, is she? Because I told my husband we're never going to have a babysitter who's too pretty. You know what I mean? <laughs> And I like, I just, I, I blinked, I went, <laughs> and she said, oh, no, 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 you're so, and I was like, oh, let's stop talking, let's stop, let's stop, let's stop doing this. Um, and that reaction is the kind of emotion I wanted to put into my novel. <laughs> the everyday domestic biases that we don't even know that we have. Uh, the week that my book went on submission, the police were called to a Starbucks in Philadelphia because two black men had decided to sit down and wait for a meeting. In that same week, a young black student at Yale fell asleep in her dorm's common area when she was studying, and she woke to police who'd been called by a concerned white student. 
I'd written the grocery store scene three years prior, and I love hyperrealism, and so I always wondered, is this believable? Does it come across as something that would actually happen? And it's a really sad and mixed feeling of relief and heartbrokenness to see how much the scene is very relevant right now. There's currently a large question as to how we talk about race and class, but I hope this novel sheds a light on the fact that we're always talking about race and class, whether we're calling it out by name or not. And as a writer, I love taking large socioeconomic problems and whittling them down to the tiny, petty moments that I think show what we're truly thinking underneath. Um, as I said, I worked as a nanny in New York City for six years, and there was a time in my life where I babysat for three families on Monday, back to back to back, another on Wednesday, two more on Friday and Saturday nights. And I worked at the craft studio, which is like a birthday party art factory. And sometimes I was doing eight children's birthday parties a week. Um, I became all too familiar with this precarious space between being with the child that you really care about, only tethered to them for an exchange of goods, and also feeling like you're truly part of the family. I learned how independent and intelligent toddlers become, even when they're two and three years old. And I became fascinated with mothers and how they wrestle with the kind of mother they watch themselves becoming. And in graduate school, I became obsessed with class dynamics and how people talk about money, how they don't want to talk about money, how wealthy people don't think they're wealthy, and how the privilege of whiteness is never limited to skin color. And this book works as a culmination of all of those experiences. Um, when I was little, there was a poster in our school library, and it said, integrity is what you do when no one is watching. And at the time, I was like, I wish no one was watching, because that means my mom wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> but now this makes more sense. Um, this novel is about integrity and what we do and what we think when we're alone. First and foremost, I just hope you enjoy it and just get lost in it. Second, I hope that this novel works as more of a mirror than a place to point fingers and blame. And lastly, lastly, I hope when you read it, it makes you feel alone, but in all the very best ways. Thank you very much.